Good morning and welcome to the seventh episode of Exchanges on Exchangers. I am Christy Smith. And I'm Cosimo Pecchioli. Today we are very excited to talk with Jaime Comella from Cloud and Heat and Verger Aubert from Fault and Fall. So can we start off with um, you both introducing yourself and telling us about your company? Jaime, do you want to go first? All right, perfect. Yeah, my name is Jaime Comella. I work for uh, Cloud and Heat Technologies. I'm located actually in, in Madrid, in Spain. But our company is from, from Germany, from Dresden. Our company um, was started around 10, 11 years ago and focused on uh, the heat reuse of data centers and distributed cloud services. So uh, this is a, if we are very, very fast in defining what we do is uh, the, are the most uh, two important things. Just uh, an extra comment uh, about that. We also use liquid cooling because we think it's the best way to uh, make data centers sustainable and to make heat reuse possible. Hey, first of all, th thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Birger Ober and I work uh, for, for Vattenfall. Uh, Vattenfall is one of the, the bigger European energy utilities and we have a bit um, a broader um, broader business. Uh, so we are, we're producing and, and distributing electricity and also heat, also in energy trading, uh, we have a variety of, of businesses in, we're one of the uh, larger um, wind park developers in, in Europe. We operate one of the largest uh, district heating networks in Berlin, uh, but we're also active in, in the Netherlands and, and in Sweden where our uh, home base is. So it's a, it's a Swedish owned uh, company. Very, very interesting. Uh, Jaime, I actually I have a question for you. Right away, um, there's a lot of different flavors of liquid cooling. Uh, there's there's cold plate. Someone says there's rear door. There's the immersion chassis base. What kind of uh, if if you have w w one let's say solution, which one do you use normally? Good uh, question, Cosimo. Actually, uh, when we we're talking about liquid cooling, uh, we must understand the uh, cold plate as a, as the liquid cooling version we use. Of course, in our data centers, are, there are a mixture of different systems. Uh, not hun Never 100% can be liquid cooled. So there's always dissipations in the air, which are air cooled, actually have, have to be air cooled. Sure. And this is almost always, in our case, indirectly with liquid cool. I mean, uh, to side coolers, rear door heat exchangers, top coolers, whatever you can have there. So this is a, but um, of course, immersion is another option. Uh, I know you know them well. Uh, this couldn't be also a problem to be integrated in our data centers because at the end of all, we are talking about pipes, water, kilowatts, power. So always at the end of all, it's the same. And uh, last question, which actually it's a it's, it's a segue for my question for Ober. Um, what temperature of the water you 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 have in your system? Yeah, thank you as well for the question <laughs> because uh, before I was trying to be compact and define everything in one minute, but absolutely. Actually, we, we started our company 10 years ago, as I said before, uh, by putting uh, black boxes, which were ecological heaters, in the cellars of private homes. The, mm -hmm. the, the people were living there were, were buying these ecological heaters, uh, but there were actually racks, racks mm -hmm. with servers inside. Those servers uh, were used by clients or the people or their, or their companies miles away from that places, from those places. And uh, the idea of uh, using those servers uh, for the heating system of those houses uh, was because we were able to get a very high temperature from them with direct liquid cooling. Which, uh, what is the high temperature? I don't know the Fahrenheit, sorry, uh, for the American. Uh, no, see, it's fine. <laughs> but there's 60 degrees Celsius. 60. Why 60 degrees? Because with 60 degrees, uh, we were able to also deliver domestic hot water, which uh, needs to be uh, uh, hot enough to kill the Janela. So, Ober, this actually uh, this this comes to you um, as as a utility company. Uh, do you think that you have a good use for a sixty degrees water stream? Um, what what is a good use? That's uh, that's like uh, that's the, what you, what you need to uh, define. Of course, we have a variety of applications. Like uh, the first applications that uh, that Jaime just explained, uh, we have. Also, a, a business that is uh, that works for uh, and with multifamily homes, for instance. So we have also a branch that delivers heating systems for for especially those homes that Chaim just uh, explained or described. 
And for these, of course, the 60 degrees is, is, is fine. But I also mentioned our very big Berlin district heating system. And for that, it is really a, uh, a challenge, especially when you think about uh, raising the temperatures, because these are run at above 130 degrees C. Uh, especially in winter times, this varies a bit over over the year. Of course, in summer you don't need that much of uh, or that high of a temperature. Uh, but when it gets really cold during winter times, you actually do need this temperature um, because Berlin is three and a half million people, and for three and a half million people, need quite a bit of heat, and you need to transport that due via via hot water. And when you have the the respective volumes, you just need the temperature in order to limit the amount of water and that's just pure physics uh, you have to limit your uh, you have to limit the amount of water you're putting through so you have to increase the amount of energy you transport per liter or cubic meter of water that's why we need a bit of a higher temperature and 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 that of course is technically feasible there are systems around to also push the temperature up uh, to that uh, to that level that that that, that we could use it uh, but this is technically and economically net not easy, and that is uh, actually something that we that we do need uh, to work on. But at the same time, looking at the amount of heat that data centers are putting out nowadays, there is just, in my view, this one single uh, sensible or or feasible heat sink actually. Because thinking about installations, I mean, I, 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 in my view, we're getting news from the Frankfurt area more or less on a weekly basis uh, that, that 100, 150, 160 megawatt data centers are being announced. And putting this amount of heat or electricity then turned into heat to good use is a challenge. And there are not many other heat sinks around that may actually make sense. Uh, on 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 a rather low temperature level, uh, apart from district heating systems. So I think it's really really important to close this gap. Which brings actually to another challenge. And 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 Jaime, since you you have been around for a few years, probably you have experienced that um, district heating or let's say domestic use is highly seasonal. Yeah. So how? What do you do in summer when you yeah. actually that heat sink that 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 Aubrey was mentioning? I mean, it goes down. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, actually, it's a it's a matter of dimensioning uh, your systems. At the end of all, if you have a uh, 10 megawatts of installed power in data center delivering, I would say, constantly 10 megawatts, you have to cover with these 10 megawatts the demand of. Uh, I would say such a large population that is always consuming that that, that 10 megawatts. Alternatively. You can always use the the, the 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 waste heat for other for other things. I mean, you can also use in summer for making cooling. I mean, it's of course thermodynamically thermodynamically not so efficient as compression cooling. But if you bear in mind that you're using a garbage and you're using something that you want to get rid of, uh, it's always good to use that garbage for making something valuable. So heat uh, for sure. heating is the most automatic thing we everybody think about. Uh, heat for cooling can be done. Heat for desalination of seawater is also possible. Greenhouses in the north when it's very cold as well. Um, Olympic pools, uh, etc. Also industrial needs for for sorry for heating like uh, wood drying. This is something very typical also in the Nordics. In uh, in, in Sweden, in Norway, they are drying wood to sell it uh, further. So we we might have to look further. I mean, in the other applications besides uh, the I would say the, the, the easiest one, even if it's not easy, as as Birger just said, uh, to be able to integrate all these data centers all around the world, not only in the coldest coldest regions. And if I if I may add, I think that's a very very important point. Integration. I think that's really a key word in this. Uh, we, we see it in uh, for the district heating part. Uh, if you look at what, what we're doing in the city is actually we are producing electricity because we also need it in the city. We're producing heat because we need it. Uh, and the same interfaces you have with the data center, just the other way around. Of course, we are producing electricity, data centers consuming electricity. We need heat, the data centers producing heat. So the interfaces sort of are the same. And that's why I always advocate for, for a bit of a different thinking that, that, that the data center is becoming or will become an integral part 
of an energy system. And the urban energy system around the district heating system is just one example of a energy system. Uh, when you think about the Nordic installation that Reine just mentioned, of course you have these massive 300 megawatt installations out in the out in the Nordics, where, where very little people compared to the amount of energy live. And if you just don't have the district heating system, you will not persuade uh, a, a, a quarter of a million people to move there just because there's cheap heat. It just won't happen. So no. uh, you have to you have to think or to to emphasize on the on the system thinking around it and, and the integration, and and bring these industries together because now what, what, where we came from uh, is very isolated business cases and people are very um, are not very eager to uh, to en engage really in in cross branch discussions because they have been having uh, super successful businesses. This goes for, for data center operations. This goes for energy utilities. This goes, goes for the wood industry. And everything has been worked on isolated, very, very successful with, with very, very uh, little incentive really for uh, collaboration and optimization. Uh, but it always came uh, at a price, and this price is increased or decreased efficiency, or not uh, not utilized possible synergies. And I think that is something that we can overcome, at least to a certain extent, via integration. That I, what I think is uh, integration is a super important word in this context. Super interesting uh, conversation, actually, and and um, we have been thinking uh, along the same lines for a for a while um but it seems that when a, a company uh, picks a new location for a, a data center um the possibility of integration with the, the, ex the existing let's say system or ec ecosystem of reality is not high in in their list of priorities cost of energy water availability uh, real estate uh, um, infrastructure of course first because if you don't if you don't have uh, connectivity or power you don't have any chance, but I mean, the possibility to reuse whatever waste energy you have, I don't think it's very high in their priorities right now, at least in the US. It it seems that 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 Europe it's a little uh, uh, ahead of us when it comes to this concept. But I, I, I maybe you can spend a few words. About how do you incentivize this integration? Jaime and, and Ober, the two of you. Yes, actually in Europe there is this uh, uh, CO2 emissions market, right? And uh, we we sell rights of emission and uh, between industries and so on. Um, or Europe also has very strong objectives of uh, decarbonizing uh, the lands, and the industries and so on. At some certain point of time, I am pretty sure that everything will be linked to the CO2 emissions rights. And uh, this will be marketed in a very broader way. So there is no way to escape that. And so there is no way to, and the, and the best way of, of um, reducing the, the carbon emissions of data centers is the waste heat reuse, definitely. Because every kilowatt, every energy unit, power unit is going inside of a data center is for producing some, some real value of services, digital services. But if you are converting that into a secondary value, and you're converting that 100% into into something that you can reuse, then your CO2 emissions are are zero. I mean, so this is uh, yeah. But so Ober and and from from your point of view, how do you incentivize it, this integration? Because currently, again, I mean, I'm talking mainly in the US, and I understand that Europe maybe it's a little more advanced, but there's not much. Yeah, as in as, as in, in because because the the stick is regulations, and no one likes regulations that what's the carrot as as in uh, as in as an engineer it 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 causes physical pain to me uh it, it, or to say this or to say the following uh it, it is mainly about money the rest is just technology and that's really causing physical pain as an engineer say, saying that it's just technology the rest is about money uh the alternative just needs to be more expensive uh, as much as it as i know that people will will cry out yeah you're hurting the economy and you're you're trying to kill projects and so on so forth so forth 
But after all, projects will happen as long as they uh, uh, result in a in, in a positive uh, in a positive business case. Uh, and if you have a desired outcome, which is uh, lower CO2 emissions, um, and you are not able to put a price tag on these, everybody everybody will choose the cheaper or more economic way. And you can't really uh, blame the people or the project managers uh, for, for doing that. After all, they have their own set of incentives. Uh, they have people they, that are financing uh, the projects. And it's just a, a matter of, you know, it's, it, I don't want to turn it into a political decision uh, or discussion, but after all, we are living in a, or working and living in an, in an economic and capitalist uh, world and, and people trying to maximize uh, the 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 outcome from of, of what what they have, so it, they are after after profit after all, and they need to compete with also with uh, with other companies. And if there is a choice, somebody will take the cheaper choice. And as long as they are in a uh, in a competitive environment, it's just natural that they do that. And you can, you can't blame them for that. So that's why I think that the incentive scheme needs to be created. And I believe this is a via a price scheme. And Raymond just mentioned it. And I think that's that's true. So we see it about around CO2 prices in in in, in Europe, and you see already now what this does to the energy uh, supply, actually, because uh, all the fossil fuels are becoming more and more expensive. We have seen a, I think, a factor of four. Uh, so we, the prices for CO2 emissions have quadrupled uh, within this year already. And 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 that is that that creates an incentive on the energy supply, and that's that the input factor. But at the same time, you of course could uh, could think about uh, just as CO2 is an emission, uh, heat is also an emission. It's being put in the in the atmosphere, and you you see this from the uh, discussions in Singapore, I believe, uh, where they where they see higher temperatures within the cities. Uh, and they at least partly link these uh, to the high density of data centers there. So it is an emission, just like diesel emissions or uh, uh, dust emissions. And they are limited by law for a good reason. And uh, to me, uh, heat is moving in the same direction. So, and if you treat it as, as what it is, it is an emission, then it needs to have a price tag. So regulation. Essentially, what you are saying is regulation. <laughs> basically, basically, yeah, yes, and or yeah, financial incentive regulation, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, it's true. When we talk about heat regeneration or, or heat reuse, we take for granted that we are talking about some sort, some form of liquid cooling, right? Uh, that there's that. Is it possible to think about a heat regeneration of an air cooled data center? Yes, it is possible. The temperature level will be lower or your overall efficiency will be lower because you were using the condensation part of the of the cooling machine. So you will have a, a lower efficiency, but it's always possible and there are use cases. Uh, in Germany, there are a couple of them. There is a really flagship project right now in Frankfurt from Telehouse, making some publicity here for them. <laughs> and uh, they are connecting to actually a district heating uh, system in the, in the city of Frankfurt. In the northern part of Germany, there is always a usage of waste heat for algae uh, farm, for an algae production growth. Um, in Norway as well, you have different examples of that, but it is maximized through liquid cooling. Uh, and this is um, physics. And of course, liquid cooling, we, we believe in liquid cooling because uh, you are much more efficient. You go down in your, in your OPEX, so in your operational costs, you go down uh, and you go up in the heat capture you you can you can have and in the in the quality of that of that heat you can store it much better you can transport it much better uh, at the end of all uh, is is the medium is in, to to use sure so we definitely see that the future is going towards liquid cooling but maybe not as quickly people are bracing the liquid cooling yes so what do you think this has been a hot topic out, out there what do you think is one of the biggest hurdles against um using a liquid cooling price okay uh totally uh again price uh why uh, price of what uh, of the hardware mostly i mean because if you're thinking about the data center the 100 kilowatts uh air cooled versus 100 kilowatts uh, mostly water cooled 
you will install less chillers. So you will actually reduce the capex uh, for yeah. that same data center, right? Uh, if you're cooling with liquid cooling with high temperatures, of course. If you are needing low temperatures, then it should be very similar because you need to cool down the, sure. the, the water for that. Um, then in the OPEX, you are going down because you are using much less power. Your, your PUE values are going down and so on. You can even sell the heat. So you get you go even down. Actually, artificially, you're putting down your, your power price with that. But in a data center, 60, 50 to 70 percent of the costs are the hardware costs. And hardware costs for water cooling, for liquid cooling, are still too high. They are still not uh, so massively produced as the other ones. This is, of course, sure. one of the reasons. And, uh, and but this should change. I mean, we we do also adapt hardware that is air cooling to the liquid cooling, and actually it costs very very few money to make the cooling blocks to adapt them inside. I mean, we have to get rid of all the fans that they come from the from the factory. I mean, if they came from the factory without that, it would be even cheaper. And uh, we can we assume costs from from five percent to ten percent more. I mean. And, in the adaptation of, of, of air cooling servers into the water cooling servers. I mean, but uh, the, 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 the reality is that the industry is still not so mature for that. Uh, mentality is, in my opinion, not a problem because uh, we do use, put water and technology together already in the data centers with side coolers, top coolers, area oh, yeah, yeah. centers. Right. So this is not an issue, I would say. I mean, it's more, for me, it's more the, the price, but it's solvable, again. A challenge that that um, data centers are facing right now, uh, particularly in the US and particularly in some areas that are uh, popular with data centers uh, that are very dry. And so water consumption <clears throat> is becoming really a, an issue. And one possible solution, as Jaime was saying, is definitely liquid cooling. But so uh, and one resource now has been seen as, as, as critical already, which is water and communities are pushing back installation of, of new data centers because of water consumption. If you if you envision a, 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 an environment in where data centers are kind of embedded in urban realities and, and cities and so you can use, do you ever see actually power availability becoming an issue uh, when you put together all these industries in one spot? Um, it, it's not really about, at least uh, in, in, in Europe, it's uh, if you want to move right now, power can be a challenge, of course, uh, but it's not the overall availability, it's more uh, the time frame is a bit difficult. So, of course, you can have, you need always the three things for a data center project, right? You need the, you need the site, you need uh, the power, you need the connectivity and everything else will, 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 sort, will sort out. But if you want to move right now, it could be that the local uh, power grid is just not fit for another very, very big electricity consumer. Uh, so at, at least that's what I know from, from most of the German market is that if you apply for a power connection uh, early enough, you will get the power because there's no overall power shortage of that because Europe has a rather strong electricity grid and the electricity will arrive at the desired point just a matter of time. So electricity as such is not right now. It could be a challenge. Yes. Uh, if you plan the normal few years ahead, then normally you should run into a problem. And because there's a that the, there's a big attention, let's say, on what what kind of energy it's used for data centers. So are you talking about traditionally f fossil fuel g generated power or renewables? That, that, that's actually a really interesting, uh, interesting discussion, especially when you think about the discussion about uh, greenwashing certificates for electricity and so on and so forth. So I think this, while this discussion sounds super easy uh, in, in, uh, at a first glance, I think personally think it, it deserves a bit more of a uh, differentiated discussion. Because uh, if you just take two scenarios, and we touched upon these earlier in the discussion, uh, take the 150 megawatt data center in the Frankfurt area. So you already have a scarcity of land, uh, and but you have at the same time, you have the district heating system, which could serve at least theoretically as, as, your, as your heat sink. But since you already are in a position where you don't have, uh, you don't have land readily available, you, you don't have the ability or the possibility 
to directly supply it with a big solar farm or with big, 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 big windmills, uh, let alone hydropower. I mean, um, this you you can't plan for this. So and and there's your dilemma. Put it in the in this in the next to the city of Frankfurt, uh, where you probably need the capacity because it's it's latency relevant for for all sure. the banking that's that's going on. You just can't put it somewhere somewhere else. It needs to be right there. And at the same time, uh, you have the possibility to reuse the heat. But then you can't have renewable direct or direct renewable supply. So is then putting uh, uh, certificates on top of that a bad thing? I wouldn't say so because you have done the best that you can, and and, and at least you have you have done the um, you have done the, um, uh, the the heat reutilization. But the other example that we had is like the 300 megawatt installation in the north of Sweden. Uh, Renewable electricity there, I mean, there's hydro abundant availability of hydropower, and that's then not a problem at all. But I th don't think one is the better or the worse system. It's just a different application and a different set of uh, um, boundary conditions, actually. I think the only bad thing you can, you can do is just ignore all of these uh, resources and uh, possibilities that you have. Um, and part of my ignorance here, of course, I, I, I'm not a very utility expert, but can you just move the energy from a solar farm or a wind farm to the data center with a with, with a new power line? It's uh, that's normally or there are different steps uh, for uh, supplying green power. Of course, you can have origins of certif uh, certificates of, of origin or you're actually matching directly the supply or production of a renewable energy uh, system um, uh, to a consumption. Of course, you you can do that, and that, that, that and the discussion is really ongoing right now. Is this really green electricity, or is this still? I mean, you can't control the electron where it flows, right? So it's just uh, it, it, the electron goes wherever it's uh, the, it's it sees the least resistance. So physically, you cannot rule out that this is coming from a uh, coal plant from somewhere in in in, in Europe. No. Because but, still, but, we, we but still you're upset, right? I mean, if you if you if you buy 100 megawatts of solar power power for your data center, someone else is and and 50 percent of that comes from a, a natural gas power plant. Someone else is not using that 50 exactly. megawatts, right? And so exactly. <laughs> this is then balancing, and uh, that's a big question. If if that that is okay. Uh, because at the same time, it's it's a balance, right? Uh, and if if you or if, if 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 the data center operator buys this amount of electricity produced by the wind farm or by the by the solar by the solar farm, it's gone, right? And so somebody else cannot use uh, cannot use renewable electricity. Uh, and I think that's that's a bit of the core of the of the discussion around that because. Uh, normally, uh, the, the data center operator is uh, is in a strong, rather strong financial position. Uh, so if, if they basically buy what's being produced from renewable electricity just to be able to say that they are green, uh, yeah. it's 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 not a pure economic. It's also a bit of a not philosophic, ethical, uh, yeah, so, something in that in that direction, right? So it basically, you you push. You push people that don't have really the free choice to use non uh, non renewable electricity uh, because there's just not enough being produced in that sense, and that I think that's a bit of a discussion. That's why 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 it tends to be called greenwashing. I don't see it that black and white. Uh, personally, I believe whenever it's 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 physically possible and 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 doable, uh, I think it, it should be attempted and and done. Uh, but also see very realistically that there are limits to this demand. Super interesting conversation. We could talk for hours, but unfortunately we have to wrap this up. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, th th this is, I, I really think that the location integration, uh, heat reuse, and, 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 and again, in, in integration with the industrial ecosystem let's say uh, should be one of the highest priorities but certainly hmm. it's it seems that right now is is it, it, it is not and, and and cosimo something we haven't talked about uh, is about uh, seeing 
the whole data center ecosystem as a connected ecosystem. You know, at the end of all, you have uh, plenty of data centers interconnected. And uh, nowadays, the typical setup is to build data centers that are totally, they can work isolated. They can, uh, they have to have a lot of redundancies, a lot of machines involved uh, in the data centers just to be available of having 99.9999% 99 of the availability per year. While uh, this could be actually ensured uh, through virtualization. At the end of all, you can, you can distribute data centers. Actually, is something we are always, uh, it's our vision, it's part of our vision to distribute data centers that communicate each other as if they were the same data center, as if they were the same building. So at the end of all, you can do a very smart load balancing between different uh, uh, locations, depending on the variables you have also. If this doesn't have any, any effect, in the service you provide to the final client of latency or so on. Some applications do not need uh, low latency and uh, are used for maybe learning models, machine learning models or so on. You can move loads where they are actually uh, optimally used or optimally, actually, yeah, optimally, opt optimally used or located, yeah. For example, if uh, in the northern part of uh, Sweden there is need for heating, then you can shift a load there uh, an IT load, so you can create that heating, and that of all is your is in a holistic way uh, better, and the, the functioning of the data center and in an energetically, physically way better. So this is something uh, actually is, is 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 not still there, but I'm pretty confident that with the edge revolution which is coming, we are actually announcing that yeah. since years, yeah. since years. I know that. I mean, it's like edge, 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 always edge. But now with 5G, I, we all hope that uh, this push is coming. And that's really uh, will produce, I would say, a development of edge locations, small locations, where they are needed actually, yeah, and where 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 the data is needed for for the close calculation to the place where the the, the clients are, and there also you can better use this waste heat reuse. This waste heat. Yeah, the edge, uh, the, the edge would be probably another whole discussion because that opens the, the, <laughs> a lot of other opportunities and and, and challenges. I, I I agree. Yeah, but yeah, excellent point, Jaime. I'd I'd like to to raise one more point uh, or again uh, and and also put a perspective on the on the temperature level because we only have touched upon this briefly. Uh, so for, for, for the use of the heat, the higher the temperature, the exhaust temperature is, the easier it really is. And changing it from the uh, formerly 25 to 28 already now with the new ASHRAE standards to, to 35 degrees C, somewhere around that, uh, the envelope, uh, but that is already a bit better. Uh, but it, it being able to receive uh, the heat at a temperature level that Cloud and Heat, for instance, is providing, is a real game changer for the for the reuse of heat. Uh, so it, it's really quite digital at 35 or at 28 degrees C. It, it normally is not possible to do this in a in a technically and economically uh, viable way. Uh, but but the 60 degree that the cloud need is able to to deliver there is really really a game changer, uh, and th th that's also a, a very very easy reason wh why we have the pilot project uh, that we are doing in just also to Stockholm together. Uh, so I need to uh, I would like to stress this that this is really really important for the heat reuse. Thank you both so much for being a part of this discussion. It was very interesting, and I, I definitely think it's going to lead to many more discussions like. Like you said, we don't have enough time in this short podcast, but it'll uh, be interesting to hear this conversation um, continue. So again, thank you both very much. And as usual to our listeners, if you have any questions, you can find us and our guests on LinkedIn. I am Christy Smith. And I'm Cosimo Picchioli. And we hope you enjoyed our podcast and we'll see you next time on Exchanges on Exchangers.